Travis Bazana, first of all, man, what, what, what do you got on this hoodie? What do you think? Is this old? Is this like last year's? I think that's last yeah. year's, maybe two years, but uh, yeah, we might need to get you a fresh one. Because I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking at yours. As soon as you, you know, as soon as you came on, I was like, oh man, that one looks sweet. Dorman, man, he's hooking me up with the old stuff. I thought this was brand new. And then I'm walking around thinking, no chance. Not with these <laughs> sleeves. No, yeah, no friggin' chance. So, first of all, man, you sent me a video, or not even send me a video. It was on your um Instagram. What the green, what does it mean when it's green, by the way, on the story? It just means I've selected a, a group of people to view that story. It's like a yeah. it's like a, they call it close friends. Gotcha. And the the video, so so the video, by the way, just to give people an idea, the video is you just crushing a ball. And the best part about the video is the audio that comes after it. One of your teammates, it was like a, what was it, BP or a scrimmage or uh, it was lives? like It was like lives, yeah, just live gotcha. up after, off our pitches. Yeah. Well, the audio was the best. And, and dude, feel free. I don't know if you're allowed. Are you allowed to share that stuff just on Instagram, just out there? Uh, I'm allowed to, but I'm not supposed to like, it would just be, you're not posting video of you hitting a tank off your teammate on your actual Instagram kind of thing. <laughs> so I keep it to like my baseball community that I gotcha. made. Yeah. So, so that's why it was basically, you just didn't want to show up whoever yeah. the teammate was. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. So if you put that out with like, I don't know, like a, like, I don't know, I, I'm going to sound old here, but a filter and some, some whatever on, on TikTok, even though you would get a ton of engagement as they call it, the pros, yeah. You just, you, you, the reason why you didn't throw that out publicly is because of your teammate. You care about your teammate. Is that right? It's, it's, I think it starts with that. And then it's also just like a moral thing. Like guys, guys just have this thing that you don't post like scrimmage homers, like out to everyone. <laughs> that's just like, a, that's a, it's just one of those, like, it's one of those, just, you know, that like, yeah. like that's a, that's a feel thing to do. Gotcha. Hey, what about so speaking of that? I'm, I'm getting off off because there's a few things I want to hit on straight away from from that swing. Just watching that swing and everything you did last summer and here in uh, working out driveline and everything else. But is it something when you look at it? Because you never really had this right. I see this on Twitter all the time. It's kind of like a dating service. I feel like you see high school kids. They get a Twitter profile, and the sole purpose for that Twitter profile is basically to so they can at college teams or at perfect game and they send out their videos so when you watch that where you're at now you're going into your second year of your second season do you look at that and, and think that's just the way it goes or is that is that is that a good thing to do if you're a high school kid or is that lame what do you think is, is that productive that's what i want to know i'm not a hundred percent like sure i think it's i think it could be part of the process nowadays because like they they see those things but you better have something electric to show. Like if you go, here's, I'm, here's my bullpen. I'm a senior in high school. Here's me throwing 83. Yeah. And you tag Ryan Gibson, Rich Dorman, OSU and Vanderbilt's coach and perfect game. Like it's not going to get the clicks and stuff probably that would make them go, damn, this guy's nasty. But like maybe posting something electric might get that buzz because the whole like yeah. Twitter retweet circles, when you tag those people, like, if you get a like from a coach here and a retweet from something, maybe it like could get right. you something. There's definitely been guys that might make a swing in a tournament that's just crushed or throw their best like fastball ever and it's 95 and you get a couple of retweets and then you got contact with these coaches. But like, I don't think it's the be all end all, but I'm not very like, uh, experience on that topic i guess have you have you had any teammates though that oh yeah hey on twitter um you know i'm not going to throw coach dorman under the bus here um but have you ever had or anyone you've played summer ball with or even down the driveline oh yeah hey i put this video out on twitter it just went nuts and all of a sudden i got these schools reaching out so here's or the any, thing or any of your teammates especially so, he, so there's one one juco transfer that like posted youtube videos of him touching 97 um and somehow it got back to our coach and I don't really know, but he's here now. Yeah. Right. And then the one thing I do know is like, if I see a high school kid on my Twitter feed, who's nasty, I care about winning and I care about the program. So like mm -hmm. I'll send videos of guys okay. to, to my coaches and be like, Hey, like maybe contact this guy. Maybe he's nasty. Like have a look at him. And we've actually like started the recruiting process and guys, because someone's tipped us off based on a video that was on Twitter. So like, I don't think it's like everything you do post on Twitter and tag everyone, 
but right. like there might be some power in having something electric and like people noticing but it's like a word of mouth thing yeah so it's, it's one of those things it's it's productive if you're and just if you're hit 97 but if you're throwing out the where you're staying in that you know that that bell curve where you're staying in the pack and you look like everyone else essentially it's kind of like uh you know it's uh, it's too much because you yeah. don't want to i feel like you just don't want to overexpose yourself either you yeah know what i mean I find yep. that with these kids, man, during the summer here in the States, they just go to every single showcase. Half the time they're gassed, especially once they get to August, because they've just been going hard. They're 16, not recovering. And then all of a sudden they're showing up and, and you know, their velos down, especially on the pitching side, or, or they just look flat. And it's detrimental because they're just yep. hitting every friggin' showcase. But hey, listen, I want to get back to I want to get back to your swing. So from when you left here, now you uh I was lucky enough to host you here for two months. Even yeah. they did, did, um, did you ever get back to you that how upset I was about you leaving the car that no gas in the? I no think car. I, I think I, Andrew, I like uh, said, yeah, Ryan was clowning on you on the podcast. I was like, damn. Yeah. Right. Well, well, I did. Yeah, we did a really good podcast. I still have to put it out. I, I still haven't put that out just yet. Andrew, I, the head hitting guy at Drive On, which by the way, what a great dude, man. Awesome. I, I gotta say. Just, I mean, you got a chance to work with him way more and been around him way more than me, but he's just got that demeanor about him where he's just kind of, he, 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 if you have a question or, or if, and, and you tell me, man, because you work with him, I, I never work with him as a player, but he sits back, he listens, he takes it in, and then he gives you the, the, what he has back to, to you, right? He's one of those guys. Yeah. I think what's special about him is like, he, exactly what you said, like, he'll sit back, listen, take everything in. And he like, he doesn't just say stuff to say stuff. Like he's the head hitting guy and he could be there like, Hey, do this, do this. Like, yeah. uh, stride out, uh, you know, you're late on that. You're early on that, like every swing. And that's like an issue with a lot of hitting guys is they'll tell you six different things in one round mm -hmm. and you can't make a quality mechanical adjustment thinking of all those cues, nor can you like be your best consistent timing or anything like that. So his ability to just take things in and then be like, have a great assessment of you and make like, yeah. Is hey, go, going back because you know Jimmy came here for a week and he did the assessment, but he was only here for a week. But he felt like his confidence was through the roof. What was it? How long leading up until before you came here? Because you were here for over two months, right? Working out. What was it like? What were the, the initial things that you said? Oh, look, that's a place I have to get to. I'm not going to go play summer ball this year. Because that's what a lot, most guys just say, oh, you know, hey, look, I have to go play summer ball for for uh, multiple you know, reasons. But if you're coming off a really good year, you're obviously on the map. Everyone knows who you are, everything else. But you obviously want to get better. What was it about saying, okay, driveline's the place I need to go to? So my, like, reasoning for it is since I committed, my goal coming out of college was to be a first-rounder. Mm -hmm. And after my freshman season, I was like, okay, like, I'm on a good track, but do I think my ceiling is first round ceiling yet? Like, do I have that upside, essentially that, like those raw tools that say first yeah. round. Right. And if I go and play 40 games in the Cape, like, do I improve my upside at all? Maybe a little bit, maybe my hit tool gets a little bit better. Maybe I like learn some things of how to play at that high level or show someone that I'm good. But like, if I play two more 60 game seasons at college, like I've got enough time to show these guys I'm good against good pitching and I'm going to go to the Cape next year anyway. So like no one's going to have to question whether I can compete at higher levels. So why don't I add the upside that's going to allow me to be a first rounder, which has been my goal for a while. So that was kind of just like that. Right. What is there that you know you talk about summer ball, is there pressure from coaches to be like, Hey, listen, we want you to go play summer ball to go work on this. Or, I mean, because, again, you're, you're a freshman coming out of college. I mean, you, you don't really get to – I remember pro ball. You, if you're an A ball, you don't have much say in what you do at all. Ma matter of fact, I was in the big leagues, and they said, hey, you have to go play winter ball then in Venezuela because we want you to start. I had no choice. I remember yep. Brandon Morrow. We're standing there in the GM's office. This was in New York. i never forget it. And he's like, hey, by the way, you guys, you guys aren't going home after the season. I was just deflated. I want to go back to Australia and just celebrate the fact that I'd made it to the big leagues. He's like, no, no, you two guys are going to go play in Venezuela for six weeks. And I'm standing there just kind of like, you know, <laughs> gut punched. And then Brandon, all of a sudden, is like, I'm not going. <laughs> Excuse me. And I'm like, I just started moving away from him. I'm like, dude, because you can't say that, right? Is, is there a situation, the college coaches, do you have any kind of say over that? The guys like, oh, man, they, I have to go play summer ball. 
uh, the one of the reasons why I t- chose Oregon State is because like I felt like it wasn't coach player down here and like the coach is just this is what you do and I know more than you and this is what you're doing. Yeah. And so I kind of knew that going in. And then I guess it felt like throughout the summer I first got to the US and then in my fall and first year, I earned a sort of respect with my coaches to where I could communicate things and talk about my work and intent with how I was training, et cetera, and have like feedback and then be open to it. And so like I'm sitting in the airport in a road trip and I just like the CBA negotiations just happened. I find out I'm junior draft eligible and I've got a pile of driveline papers of like their assessments and things. Um, and I'm starting to write down goals and like talk, thinking about what I'm going to do in the summer. And my hitting coach comes over to me and he's like, what are you doing? I was like, he's like, what is this? I'm like, uh, I'm thinking I want to do that in the summer and, mm-hmm and pass up on the Cape. And like his first kind of reaction was like, wait, what, like, why would you pass up the Cape? Like what, what good hitters go to driveline? Like kind of what, what, what's the reason for that? Yeah. And, and I just explained myself and within three, four minutes, he's like, yeah, I think that'd be really good for you. And like, Sweet. I'm open to that. And then I go to Mitch Canham, our head coach, and he was open straight away. And he's got to make, at the end of the day, he's got to make the phone call, tell the summer ball guy, Hey, you need to get another guy because Trav's not going to be coming. So it's not an easy thing for him. Like he, the easy way out for him is to go, Oh, uh, like, no, mate, you're playing the Cape. We don't, you don't just get to make that decision. That's what, like my decision. But he heard me out and was like, yeah, I think that's a good plan. And I think I just earned the trust of like, they believed that whatever I was going to do, I was going to put my all into it and get something out of it. Cause again, and I want to reiterate this and I want you to explain what the Cape is to get some, you know, Americans know who that is, know what that is, but Australians may not and how big of a deal that is to play Cape Cod in the summer ball. Cause there is so many first rounders going to the Cape. That's just the way it goes. It's been for years. Right. But what percentage of your teammates and you have to throw anyone on the bus or any, or anyone at your level would just be like, look, all right, they know what's best for me. I'm not going to argue this. I'm not going to stand up because it may be detrimental to where I stand with in this relationship with the coaches. What percentage of guys would actually do that? Do you think? 80% would, 80% wouldn't say anything. Right. That, that 80, just, that'd go along with it, right? 80% that, or more like of the guys at this level and in, in like at my school, like would just accept the fact and, and kind of like, and do what they're kind of, planned out to do by the coaches and that's a, like that's respectable that's all good yeah. that's not their personality to like discuss conflict argue debate it's yeah. not really argument but you know what i'm saying i understand uh, um it's not in their personality and also like they feel like they're not in a position to say anything about yeah. what they should be doing and so i think like yeah the guys that earn that respect in a way of the coaches to like the coach knows that this guy's going to get better if he puts time into himself. They uh, they know that and they can speak up more. But I think it's just like you, uh, you feel it out. But where, Trav, where does that come from, dude? Because, I mean, I, like I said, I've known you since you were, what, 12, 13 years old, right? And, you know, back then too, and, and, and going back to, you know, when I first hung out with you, especially on that BLD trip, um, you know, you were always that sort of that, you know, type A sort of personality. You had your, your, we've talked about it a bunch where you've had your notebook, you know, at the end of the BLD trip and write notes and everything else. But where, where is that kind of, because some guys, if you are, first of all, if you're not sure of yourself or your ability or, or the fact that you can come out of this in a positive way, because it can be frigging detrimental. You start messing around, you go to the driveline, come back and your swings completely changed. You get to the fall and the ball's just not coming off your bat very well. And you have all that in your head, all that doubt saying, you know, I'm going to piss a lot of people off here, but where does that come from for you, dude? Like where, where, where did that start for you? What age did you feel like, you know what? I know what's right for me. I'm just going to trust it. There's, I'm going to, and you're going to have doubt. Everyone has the doubt, right? It doesn't matter who you are. Even when you get to the big leagues and everything else, right? That comes along. But where does, for you, what point was it like that? Because there's a lot of that coming up, especially in Australia in, in regards to you have to go on this trip, you have to go on that trip, you have to do this program, that program. Yeah. I think there's probably two like key things that taught me like the power of, having a vision for myself, like greater than anyone else. 
and then just going after it and being all into like what that process is going to involve and then getting something out of it. And I think it starts with like nine, 10 years old, little league. It's like my dad ingrained in me, like, Hey, like I'm going to come home from work early. Cause we're going to get to practice early and hit because it's going to pay off. Those extra swings are going to pay off. Like if you're taking the same amount of swings as the next guy, you're, you're probably just going to be the same as that guy. Almost right. like he didn't like push me to do that, but he was like, Hey, the best guys, they're taking extra swings. And so that started there is like, I wanted to go out and get better in my off, like in my off time. And then I think the biggest thing was like 14, 15 ish. I like took an off season off, like took a winter off where I didn't play winter ball or whatever. And I was like, okay, these are my goals. This person thinks I can't hit this. This person thinks I can't throw from the left side of the infield. And I was just like, oh, uh, everyone thinks I'm not good. I just missed out on the under 15, 40 man squad for the World Cup. And I was like, how is everyone not seeing that I'm good? That's what I was thinking in my head. And I like had this, this winner where I just got so much better because I like had a daily process to these goals. And then I came back and everyone was like, damn, like you're way better, Trav. And so that was like the first point where I was like, okay, as long as I take time to like put daily effort into something and trust the process of like a span of time with goals, I was, it's going to work out for me. And I think it, yeah, it just started then. And I just rolled with that. It's funny, man, because I, I run into this a lot with kids where you give them something and they trust it. They walk away and say, man, this is great. This is new. This is something that's new. So it's shiny. You know what I mean? And then two, three weeks in, they get some results kind of quick, especially, you know, in regards to pitching, right? That velo, they, they get a couple of little jumps and they're doing new different stuff. So like, oh, okay, maybe this is a new way to, to do it because the old way wasn't working, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, three weeks to a month in, the honeymoon phase is over. Yep. And they just go, you know what? Uh, they're kind of plateauing out a little bit, and and that trust go the the not the the patient go patients go away. They don't trust it as much because they're not just keep getting those tick up tick ups, and then all of a sudden they fade back into what they were doing before, which is just what the what you're supposed to do. So again, you talk, and going back to when you're 14 or even this summer at, at drive line, there had to be those days, right? We like, man, you sort of question or you have to reset on what you're doing, right? To to keep that to to just keep that trust or that flame that that flame going. Yeah, it's a perfect question because like this summer, I'm okay. So like two weeks in, I'm like, damn, like yeah, fresh. I know what I need to work on. Just got the assessment. I'm like, this is perfect. Four weeks in, I'm like, I've made hardly any process, and I'm almost halfway through my summer. What I'm like starting to question. Oh, was this the right thing? Like. I'm training with all these high school guys, college guys, and I'm like not even looking better than them. I feel like I'm not getting better. I was literally like, I had days where I was thinking these things in the summer. Yeah. And I'm I, like, I remember you'd come home, you'd come home like, you're all right, dude. And you just kind of sit there like, eh. and then, but then there was those days were completely different, but yeah, keep going. Yeah. I remember that. And so I think I get to like week five, week five or six. I'm like, I'm halfway through. I've made tiny little jumps. My swing feels the same. I feel like I haven't like, made the changes that I should have for my assessment. And I've been working, working consistently, just grinding, like trying to get, trying to, I was locked in, but I wasn't seeing the gains. And then one day it just all clicked. And then like it clicked and I consistently like progressed from there. And then like you get, you finish the summer and like, it's still not linear, but like I went slightly, slightly, nothing, nothing, nothing. But then all that work, like allowed me to have that jump and then I rode it and then you got, you flatten out again, you plateau, but like it's not linear. And that's what people don't understand is they think that you put a day of work in, you get a day of works like gains. It's like, right. it's, that's not how it plays out. Yeah. It, 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 it Describe that what clicked because, uh, because in case if someone's listening with, especially when they're 15, 16, 14, even, and they're working out they're, they're sticking to some some kind of program describe what that means when it clicked what was it like if you can put it if you can articulate was it in like, the cage was it off like the like the, the the change that clicked or like the feeling of like what clicking is like yeah both well what what, what okay if there was a change there uh, yeah so so essentially 
the biggest issue in my assessment that we were trying to curve throughout the summer was my posture throughout my swing. So mm-hmm. I had too I much forward, that, yeah. forward bend at my hips. So I was bent over like this, trying to hit a ball. And I had too much side bend as I rotate. So essentially it was just kind of making my bat path very north to south. Um, and at driveline, like you're training off a 90 mile per hour machine, off an 85 mile per hour slider, curveball, whatever, whatever. It's a tough environment to train in. Like you're not going to square every ball up. It's not arm um, batting practice. And so me being a competitor and, and basically everyone, like you, you go back to old habits when you're in a challenging environment. It's really hard to like change your swing when you're trying to compete and not look stupid to the guy next to you. I was hitting, having a horrible day in the cages week five or week six of my summer. And my, one of the hitting coaches was like, you're diving your front shoulder a bunch. Like you're not making the changes you need to make. And I was just like, yeah, it's just, tough like that's all i know i've been doing that since i was young and he goes all right like hit hit from the slot you want to hit from forget the low like hit from where you're trying to get the bat to to be connected and swing and so i took like three rounds where i just hit from like the bat next to my shoulder Mm -hmm. and so i didn't i couldn't like get out of whack with my posture and manipulate the barrel like i had to turn from the right spot right and I raked, I went whack, whack, left center, right center, left center, right center. And I was like, I haven't hit like this in three weeks, like five weeks. And it was exactly the change that we were trying to make. And I was like, damn. And so for the next day, two days, I hit like that and was focused on my posture being really tall because that's kind of the exaggerated change I needed to make. And then all of a sudden, after those two days, I'm like, two days go by. I'm like, okay, I need to incorporate my load back and have some fluency to the swing. And I start incorporating my load, but I, I have that posture starting to ingrain and it feels so good that I'm like, all right, this, this is what needed to be. I, I find the posture that works from just hitting with no load. And then I started incorporating my load back and everything changed. My bat speed went up. My, the, the assessments with the KVS and biomechanics looked clean. Like they looked like the pro guys versus what I was doing wrong. Yeah. And my exit velos went up. And then all of a sudden my batted balls were just consistent. And then from there I could add the bat speed. I was trying to add the whole time because I had made the like core change of what we wanted to work on. And yeah, I'd been searching for it for five, six weeks, getting a little bit better. And then sometimes it's one thing and then you can like really make the jumps. But if you don't put the time in consistently and trust it, you never have that clicking moment. Yeah. It's man. It's so hard to get to this. That's I call it like the, that the, the plateau phase, that's the toughest to get through. Like, yeah, there's a kid I work with here, Logan, uh, Logan Anderson, this right-handed pitcher who, you know, I was watching him. He got some couple good jumps, you know, right away, and then plateaued. And then all of a sudden, he's like, you know, 84s, 86s, and and he's like, what the hell is going on? And he's battling with some fatigue. He's in a bit of a deficit, and he's trying to find it. And then, boom, all of a sudden, he, you know, video of him you know 90 91 finally you know what i mean like bang it just it, it comes but it takes i talked to josh Kestner about that too you know that freaking meat and potatoes every single day and just riding it out it's freaking hard hey speaking of driveline when so when you got there just explain what the process is you get to you get down there the first week's the assessment week right yep so what does that entail what, what, what's in the assessment week so yeah first week you go in and your first assessment's kind of a biomechanics assessment in the in the lab so you have dots all over your body trying to swing as hard as you can and and they're they're essentially seeing where you're flawed in your mechanics and um also just building baseline data of where you're at um and then you have a strength assessment which is like power testing strength testing um kind of see where your athleticism is and where you like what you can create with that body in your swing yeah um and then uh, movement assessment, see if you're like, there's things that are holding back your mechanics just on based on range of motion and all the rest. <clears throat> and then you test, yeah, a bunch of other things, little things like um, K vest and all your blast data is tracked the whole time and, and batted balls. But by the end of the week, you sit down with your, your coach and go through all these assessments and they really get into depth of like, this is where your biggest flaws are. This is where your strengths are. And this is what we're going to attack 
to then make those big jumps. Um, and it's pretty legit, but I think that you have to have a good understanding of your, your body and your swing from the work you've put in and the research you've done to get the most out of that is cause like they're going to talk in pretty uh, specific terms and like, they know how to make it simple, but like if you haven't felt different things in your swing and understand different movement patterns and your body, it's tougher to like know what you're going to take out of that assessment. Yeah. That's, so. a, that's a great point, man, because like you know, you're a bit of a baseball nerd in a good way. You know, you follow all the, you know, the hitting guys on, and, and you, you like to speak that language. We had a good chat. I remember when, Oh, by the way, did you give your report to the pitchers? Yeah. I, how'd uh, that go down? How, how'd that go? it went great. Like they honestly were super grateful. Okay. Um, and yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. I was a little, when you left here, I was like a little worried. I was like, man, how's that going to go down with, with, with the pitching stuff? But I remember I, was, I spoke to, I went there when I went there with uh, Josh, Natalie and Liam Grant, um, later on i spoke to your head coach about it and uh, he was like dude it's awesome you know he thought it was great um but no dude, I, I mean it's funny man because everyone you, everyone wants that that you know that that secret ingredient that magic pill into doing it but you have to understand you know what it is you're doing you have to understand what are some of the things that you can what, what like and, and the other thing is too i think trav understanding when you do get those weak links all those flaws that you have is not in a sense, because this was my biggest problem. I'd say, okay, you're deficient in this. And I would dwell on that go, man. So I was worried I was going to slide back into that deficiency as a pitcher or that mechanical flaw. Okay, man, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to you know, fall back into that. Or if I couldn't find, couldn't get out of that mechanical flaw. You know what I mean? And I mean, I'm sure you're, you're different to me in that regard, but it's one of those things that going into it, you got, you got to be. You do have to be ready to go for that first week. I feel like yep. I remember sitting in that that meeting as oh man, it's it's a lot. Like it's a lot to take on. It really yep. is. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think that like you've got to understand that at this age, especially, you've got to be able to face up to those so called weaknesses and be like, I'm going to do everything in my power to get rid of like get rid of them and make them strengths. I think, um, and also just be open to information and like if you've done your own research and you're willing to listen to everybody out there and try different things over time, you build like an understanding of yourself and an understanding of the information out there that when you get told what's wrong in your swing or yeah. whatever, you know how to apply things intrinsically versus like just listening to the drills you got to do. And you know, don't actually know what the, like the feelings and the, the right. goal of it is. Yeah. That's a great point, man. I mean, you can give, I've done that before. You give these drills and if they don't feel it, it's a waste of time. Their, their yep. trust goes out, out the window. Hey, speaking of something else, another thing you said to me multiple times here with these Australian kids, and you're at a really good D1 program and you, you're you thriving, you play it as a freshman, all this. You do say to me, like a lot of these Australians could play at this level, right? What do you mean by that? I mean that... Explain yourself. <laughs> you get here and I, I see who I compete against. And I also see our, our freshmen, my class, the next class. Like, I think like I've seen two freshman classes now at Oregon state. So guys that are coming in fresh out of high school. Um, and I've seen freshmen all across the pac 12 and, and the West coast. So I know like what a kid coming out of high school in Australia looks like and what those, these guys in America that are highly recruited look like. Mm -hmm. And people seem to think the talent gap is like this. And really, it's like this for most people. It's, it's really not huge. But the, the gap is that these kids are told they're great and they're an Oregon State commit and they're legit and they're ready for it. And so they walk in and they believe it. Our guys are often told, you're not ready for it. You should do something else because you're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. And so they go into it and their head's like, I'm not ready for it. And then you, you go, damn, you have one bad game early on. You're like, damn, I'm, I wasn't ready for it. I shouldn't have gone to this level or like, or you just take the easy route and go somewhere else. So obviously there's, there's good routes for everyone. It's, I'm not saying everyone should go to power five D one, but I do know that like, <laughs> there's more people that can than people think. And I've seen what talent levels there is, but 
the way you can make yourself ready as a freshman is like the difference maker in freshman is like, it's not talent. It's which kids can step in and be like, I'm a dog. I don't care who's around me. I don't care if you're a senior. I don't care if you're a junior. I don't care how young I am or where I'm from. Um, I'm, I'm going to compete and be legit. No, you're right, man. And it's tough. It's, it's, understanding the process and all these things is one thing, but walking in and saying, you know what, because you hear that all the time. You're like, uh, it's this glass half empty mentality. And I'm lucky if I get a shot or they're doing me a favor when you got to, it's hard, it's hard to rewire yourself to say, you know what? No, I'm, I'm doing these guys a huge favor. The fact I'm here because I'm going to frigging come out and be a dude. It's hard to have. It's hard to have that. It really is, especially coming from Australia. It's that un, that underdog, you know, mentality you have your whole life. I want to leave you with one thing before I let you go, my man. So now you got to go. What if you were six? If you were talking to the sixteen-year-old Travis right now, what what would you tell him? What would some advice you'd give a sixteen-year-old Travis Bazana or a kid? You know what? If Travis Bazana wasn't a stud at sixteen, let's say <laughs> I'm. Let's say you're talking to a sixteen-year-old Ryan Roland Smith who sucks, right? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, way behind the eight ball in, in regards to talent. What do you got for him, dude? I'd say most people aren't going to make the big leagues till they're at least 23, 24 years old, right? So if you – I think you better have – Ryan, you better have a vision of yourself at 23. You're 16 right now. you got seven years to be a big league player. If you, like, break that seven years down and consistently get better, there's no reason you can't be 95 – with three pitches and be able to command them all and be a big league left-hander. Like you've got seven years. It's not like this. It's so far away, but you've got to just break it down and consistently get better. So if I was talking to a 16 year old, say, understand that you should be having great visions of yourself doing like special things, but then you just got to like trust short-term processes and understand the goals you need to attack. So you can see what, you can see what a big leaguer looks like every day of your life. You can see every left-hand pitcher, in the big leagues and understand what you need to do to be that guy if that's what you want to do so have that vision for yourself and then just consistently like working towards those things um i'd say you just got to believe you got time i I love it dude because going back and i think about being a teenager all the time and i'm talking to these teenagers or trying to help them or whatever it is i was so caught up in in the in the moment not in a good way in other words saying oh looking around me this is where i'm at boom as opposed to doing that, I like it. Seven years, which by the way, goes quick when you get to my age, my man, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> but uh, Travis, this has been fun, dude. This has been good. I'm looking forward to when you get, are you getting back down the drive line at all? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at when I can kind of space it in. Um, but right now it's probably looking like maybe December or um, the year after. So maybe, yeah, ne- within the next two years. Sounds good. Well, mate, yeah. you, you... <laughs> There's always a car here for you. Just make sure you give me some petty pe- petrol money. No worries. Uh, now, this has been fun, man. I appreciate your time, dude. And uh, we'll see you soon. We'll, we'll all be watching. Thanks, bro. It's been awesome. See you, champion.